Amen. Be lifted up, Lord. Be lifted up today, Lord, in our hearts, in our minds. It's all about you. This morning, it's all about you. Our lives, it's all about you, Father. Speak to us, we pray. We pray for the words that come from you, Lord, from your throne. A million words from Louis will produce nothing, but one word from you is enough. So speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Guys, today we continue our series about the seven churches or the letter to the seven churches in Revelation. And today we'll be talking about Pergamon or the first part of this letter to the church of Pergamon. Because I'll continue next time. And if you are with your Bible, let's open in Revelation chapter 2 verses 12 to 17. Revelation chapter 2 Verses 12 to 17, the Bible says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamon write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you. Where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teachings of Balaam. Who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. So that they might eat food sacrificed to idols. And practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. Repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Amen. Guys, early on this week, something amazing happened. Something unthinkable. Most of our social media was out of the air for six hours. <laughs> and that was chaos for some people. Families, they were forced to talk. They were forced to be in the same room and actually have a conversation together. You know, I was reading uh, some restaurant owners saying that people were behaving strangely. They actually talked. They didn't take thousands of pictures of their food. They didn't share with the world what they were doing. That was unthinkable. That was different. When I think about social media and all the complexity that it brings, it's impossible not to have mixed feelings. Because at the same time that we love the fact that people are connecting, are discovering how other people live in the other side of the world and how quick it is to receive now just information in real time of what is happening somewhere. How cool is that? But at the same time, we see people having arguments about everything under the sun. People that are totally experts in almost nothing. Or people that have an opinion about everything. And wow, when COVID came, how many scientists we discovered among us? People that oh, don't believe in scientists. They just studied 15 years for that. Actually, just let's trust in my mechanic. He really knows what he's talking about. Yes, this person, yeah, don't believe it. No, they study. They are the official person to talk about. No, no. Let's hear my brother. He's in the seventh grade, but he really knows this is not good for you. That's what we see in social media all the time. And this mix of cultures and opinions and just bring the whole world together. It's very divisive sometimes. People can argue and block each other and just stop to follow each other. And some people get even angry. If you don't like their pictures or don't like what they are doing. This is the equivalent of the context of the church in Pergamon. Uh, the city of Pergamon. This community 
they were not very important financially, but guys, they were the political capital of that region. And not just that, they were, they were the gatekeepers of religion. Political power and religion together, that's what was happening there. People from all over Asia Minor was fleeing from there, all with their own opinion. All with their own, that's what we should do. That's how they should live their lives. That's the kind of God we should follow. They were the first community in a whole Roman Empire to be allowed to worship a living emperor. And they build, they build uh, four stores, temple to worship. Not just that, but they had a temple for Zeus. Not just that, but they had a temple for Asclepius or something like that, if you read in proper English. But they had a temple for them, for him. He was the God that was healing people. His symbol was a serpent. And you know, people used to call him the savior. And in the middle of all that mixture, all that thing, a place that everyone had to worship the emperor. You could worship other gods, but you had to worship the emperor. And was the most persecuted place for anyone that didn't worship the emperor. On this place that they had the second largest library in the world with 200,000 scrolls. In the middle of all that was very easy to lose from sight who has the last word. Or who has the last post? Who has the utmost word that we need to follow? And that is the first thing that Jesus reminded the people of Pergamon. He says, hey, I have the last word. I have. It's not people from all of that. It's not all those people with opinions and not what people really like to do. Doesn't matter if you are being persecuted, blocked, unfollowed, or anything else. I have the last word. I, st I am still in control of your life. I'm still leading. I'm still governing. I'm still God. He's still God of your life. Doesn't matter how many unfollows or unlikes or anything else you have or may have. We still have a God that is in control. How cool is this message? He still have the last post, the last message, the last word. He still have that. And when he shared and when he said to people, look, I have the sharp two-edged sword. For us nowadays may sound like a cartoon ish kind of thing but on people at the time they really understood what that meant and that meant that the officials of the time the roman leaders of the time they had uh, the law of the sword what that meant is that they could decree that someone would be killed and someone would be killed they would walk with that sword that was a representation of the power that they have and not just that, they were abusing that power against Christians on the persecution. But Jesus was reminding them, guys, don't worry about who can persecute your body. Don't worry who can unfollow you on social media. Don't worry about those people who say bad things about you. I have the power and I have the less authority to judge the living and the dead. And I am saying to you, well done. Jesus is the one with the last word. Jesus is the one that is saying to us, don't get discouraged if your life is in collision with the culture and society around you. On this time where you can be blocked by almost everything and anything, don't get discouraged if your way of life is in collision with the values that is out there. Remember, there is someone that has the power to judge you eternally. And he's saying, live by my word, my post, my guidance. And that's eternal. And then he continues to say to his people, say, hey guys, I know things are difficult. I know you are suffering persecution. I know you are under attack. You are being forced and encouraged to worship and to behave in a different way. Different from my word. But hey, guys, pay attention to that. I know that you are living with the devil. That's what he says here. 
I know where you live. I know where you dwell, and that's where Satan's dwell. I don't know if you had a bad neighbor before, or maybe you have a bad neighbor now. Let me tell you, when Dani and I, we got married in Brazil, we had a neighbor. I, I, I cannot imagine someone that can smoke weed like that man did. <laughs> But my house was like a constant fog all around my house. Actually, when Louis Jr. was born, he never cried. He was laughing for the first year. It was like, yeah, it was like a fog. And, and he was laughing. Danny was laughing. Our Bible studies were really good. Everything was amazing. A lot of experience, guys. But let me tell you something. He was a complicated neighbor. He was using drugs. He was doing a lot of stuff. He was selling some weird stuff, on, on, you know, on the side of my house, having parties till the night. And that was a neighbor that I would say, Lord, this neighbor came from hell. It's really bad. But pray for them if you have a, a bad neighbor. But let me tell you something. What Jesus said to them and the word that he used for dwell, that is katoikeo. It really means someone that has a permanent address near you. What Jesus was saying to them is saying, hey guys, I know that you and the throne of Satan is on the same street. I know that you are living on a seat that is being controlled by the enemy. I know that you are in a place where the authority and the culture is, are not shaped by me or by what I want. They decided to follow something else. But you know what is the most upside down culture that we can understand on this text is this. Don't flee from it. Run to influence that. That's the message of Jesus here. Guys, I know. I know you have a neighbor from hell. I know you are in a very difficult culture. I know that people are persecuting you. I know people are doing things that you, you don't like even to think about. I know all that. But you know what? Your city needs you. Your church needs you. And your city needs the community of God that you are part of. Don't flee from it. Go and transform it. That's what the message of the Lord is saying. We are not called to flee from it. We are called to be uh, empowered by the Spirit and go to allow transformation to take place. You are part of the redemption of your community. And that's not just for Edom, guys. That's for every one of us. That's for every one of us. You are part of the redemption of your neighbor. You are part of the redemption of your community, of your town, of your city. But, Louis, it's very difficult. It is. But... Uh, The Lord never said to me, I know you dwell where the throne of Satan is. I might have had some difficult neighbors, but never like that. But that's not an excuse to flee. Don't move from where you are until the Lord says so. But until you are there, be God's presence. The transformation, redemption of the place where you are. God wants to pour out his glory in your life in such a way that where is death And where is just a dry desert will become an oasis in the middle of a complicated place. And then all of that will be transformed because the people called by the name of the Lord humbled themselves and prayed and asked God. And God healed that land through them. Are you one of them? Are you one of them that will stand and say, God, like the people of Pergamon, I know the gates of hell will not stand. So we will march and we will see transformation taking place on this place. Because if you are, guys, nothing can hold you back. Nothing. That's what Jesus was saying to them. Don't quit. Don't stop. Don't give up. I'm with you. I know it's hard, but I am with you. And then he continued to say, you need to be there. You need to transform the place where you are. But again, guys, don't get so used to the place where you are. To the point that there is no difference between you and them. You are different. We are in a moment where people are amazed with the idea to be exactly like everybody else. And let me tell you something. Although we need to communicate culturally in a relevant way. We need to build bridges and all that. You are different. Fundamentally you are different because the spirit of God lies on you. And don't expect everybody else to applaud that. You are different. You know, we started this week our very first advanced group in Kuwait. 
And I was amazed when I was talking to them and they started and I felt so happy. But then I started to think and say, Lord, these guys live in a very complicated place. Ben is having conversation with people in Myanmar and, and other countries that are advanced are, is going right now. There's real persecution. And then I was thinking, Lord, and I, and I was talking to someone and said, look, I know there's persecution where you are, but how do people know that? Do they hack your email? Do they hack your bank account to know you are a Christian? How do they do that? And a person just replied to me, said, Louis, it's very easy. They know we are different. <laughs> And I stopped and I started to think, said, Lord, if, what if in England becomes illegal to talk about Jesus? Would people know that I'm different just by the way I behave? Would people know that I'm different just by the smile that I carry or the way I treat others? They would see there's something different or people would say, nah, Louis is like us. He's exactly like us, just with a weird accent. <laughs> I hope not. The thing is, we need to be like Antipas. And the text says, Jesus says about Antipas, and he says, uh, Yet you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness. Antipas was one of the leaders of the church in Pergamum. And they, he hold fast, and he was encouraging people to hold fast. In other words, what Jesus said is, is you held fast to your faith in me, and that's a big deal. Well done. Well done. In the middle of persecution, in the middle of difficulties, in the middle of COVID season, in the middle of all that, well done. Hold tight. Jesus is with you. He's not tired. He will not be sleeping. He is with you. Well done. Persevere. Keep going. Allow Jesus to speak through you, in you, and to people around you. Guys, Antipas was not just someone that was a leader on that, on that community. He was one of the pillars of that community. And he was killed, probably, in accordance with most theologians, on, on the altar to Zeus. And the way they did, they used a metal ox and they opened that, that ox, that bull. And they put him there and they closed and put fire beneath. And while he was screaming, or anyone would be screaming, the sound would come like if the ox or the bull was alive. But you know what? There's a story that says that while that was happening, he was praying for the faithfulness of the people in that community. God knows that when something like that happens, it's just a wave in our communities. And he knows that our faith is revealed in the most difficult times. God was saying to that people, guys, I know it's hard. I know your faith is being tested right now because someone you love just, just died this horrendous death. I know persecution is hard. I know people look weird to you. I know everything that is happening. But you know what? Maybe you are passing exactly through that moment where your faith is being tested today. And maybe you are saying, Louis, maybe I, I'm not losing someone in a situation like this, but maybe I'm just facing a big change in my life and my faith is being tested. Louis, maybe what happened is just, a, it's not a tragedy with a leader in my church, but it's someone that I know that was just suffering with COVID. Or someone that I know that is just suffering with mental health. Or someone that I know just lost their faith and I don't know how to cope with that. Let me tell you something. Jesus is here today to say to you, I know it's hard, but hold on. I'm with you. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to me. I will help you. I have the last post. I have the last word. And if you focus your life on him, he will never be out of the air. He will always be available to you. Things might be hard, but Jesus continues the same. Faithful, powerful, and available. And today he wants to help you and help me. Don't run. Don't run from him. Don't run from where you are. Run to him and allow him to use you. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, you are good. You are glorious. You are amazing. You are wonderful. God, we are in a world where... Sometimes we are even afraid to write on social media 
because people take things out of context and accuse things, not just what we are writing today, but maybe 10 years ago. But Father, it's so good to know that we are not alone on that. People 2,000 years ago were passing exactly the same kind of thing. And today, Father, the same promise is still to us. That maybe we are passing through difficult times. Maybe we are dealing with the fact that, yes, we are different, but we want to communicate the gospel. Father, I pray for everyone that are living a different, difficult moment right now. Everyone that their faith is being tested. Everyone that have this temptation just to run from where they are because it seems like I live on the same road as the devil. But your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your promise still stands, Lord, that we are agents of miracle. We are people that proclaim the living God. And this is the beginning of redemption. So use us, Father, we pray. Use us powerfully to your glory that as the people of Pergamon we may hear your words and hear Lord that we don't we don't have to run we can just open ourselves to you and you are the strength the transformation and the power that is needed whatever we are in any circumstance that we might be facing I bless everyone that is here everyone that is watching Lord in Jesus name amen amen God bless you guys You've been watching Message Live. And we hope it's been a great encouragement to you. Would you subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, and ring that bell for notifications. And thanks for watching.